Indiana Jones is a series of action-adventure films set before World War II, made from 1981 to 2008, about an archaeologist and college professor of the same name played by Harrison Ford. His day job is pretty dry, but more often than not you'll find him visiting non-white countries in search of ancient artifacts while punching, shooting and whipping a whole lot of people in the process, usually Nazis or brown people, as well as hooking up with beautiful women in often emotionally and physically abusive ways. The concept and story for the first film was created by George Lucas and Philip Kaufman, with George shepherding the rest of the series' story credit either by himself or with others. The screenplays were all written by different writers, but all four films in the franchise were directed by the big boy himself, Steven Spielberg. Before I started writing this video, I'd never seen an Indiana Jones movie. I mean, I thought I knew everything I needed to by the Simpsons parody alone and I was happy with that. But one day I needed the palate cleansing action adventure film to watch and I saw Raiders of the Lost Ark was on Netflix. And I thought Spielberg directing, I really liked Minority Report, Saving Private Ryan and God I absolutely love Hook. Story by George Lucas, who doesn't like Star Wars. Script by Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Starring the epitome of a sci-fi rogue, Harrison Ford. And it's an incredibly lauded series by fans and critics. So I want you to know that I really went into the first film in the series as a whole wanting to like it. And there are things to like for sure, but it's bursting at the seams with racist tropes that Western film still hasn't seemed to get past in the 38 years since Raiders came out. When I originally created this channel, my ethos was to create positive video essays focusing on filmmakers of colour and their films. This video may seem a 180 in some respect, highlighting a flawed piece of media made solely by white filmmakers. However, in making this, I hope it will reinforce why we need authentic and diverse creators in all levels of the filmmaking industry. I'm going to tackle this analysis through the lens of three sections, which are colonization, colonialism and white saviour, racist casting, and perspective, dehumanization, and mysticism. Each section covers a few tropes within them. At the end, I'm also going to suggest how these tropes could have been avoided and remedied for both this franchise and films in general. Fair warning, there's going to be spoilers from the get-go, so let's get into part one. It's well known that the influences for the films were the action-adventure serials of the 1930s like Flash Gordon, Tarzan, Buck Rogers, The Lost City and Zorro. So it's not necessarily a surprise that these racist tropes have carried over. For the most part, these influences and the Indiana Jones film share the common theme of a white explorer in a seemingly new world, which leads into colonisation and colonialism. I've actually used the two interchangeably with that much thought on a lot of occasions, but there is a very clear distinction that I want to note. Quick definitions. Colonisation refers to migration or settlement for land and resources by way of genocide, like America and Australia, where colonialism refers to control of a new territory for trade, labour and resources by way of violence and subjugation, like India and Sri Lanka. Colonisation and colonialism have existed since the dawn of man, but I'm talking about the modern context which mainly refers to British imperialism and the creation of the British Empire. Land, structures, monuments and objects are all resources and signifiers of wealth, and the Empire pillaged plenty, shipping a lot back to Britain itself for display in museums, much of which you can view to this day. The entire premise of Indiana Jones is an Anglo-American archaeologist slash adventurer who loves history and in particular, artefacts. I've distilled his motivations as a character into three separate but interrelated categories. One, personal desire slash museum preservation. Two, to save someone. Or three, for the greater good. Let's tackle this chronologically in the franchise timeline with each artifact he's after. The Cross of Coronado. In the films, it's the first item we see Indiana after. In a trip with his scouts regiment as a teenager, he stumbles upon some scavengers finding the cross. He doesn't know what their intentions are, but he affirms to his friend that That cross is an important artifact. It belongs in a museum. He gets the cross, but the local sheriff turns it over to the scavengers. This is the inciting incident for Indy's colonial fascination with artifacts. You know how long I've been looking for that? All your life? All my life. Well done, Indy. Very well done, indeed. This will find a place of honour in our Spanish collection. We can discuss my honorarium over dinner and champagne tonight. Your treat. Yes. My treat. My precious. The peacock side. It's an item that Indy seeks in payment for the ashes of the late Chinese Emperor Nohachi. He doesn't get it, but we can infer from the general desire and emotions he expresses, his goal is to obtain the diamond for the museum. Shivalingam. Indy is asked by an Indian shaman to recover a shivalingam, which is a sacred object in Hinduism that in the film apparently affords good luck to the village. A cult stole it, along with the children who lived in the village. Indy smiles and nods, but refuses politely. A kidnapped child escapes back to the village and gives Indy a piece of cloth. On it, Indy introduces it talks of the five powerful Shankara stones or shivalingams. 
It's only then that he accepts the call to action with the line, Fortune and glory, kid. Fortune and glory. Fertility Idol. He doesn't outright say, but after a rival takes the idol from him, Indy shows Marcus Brody, the curator of the museum and dean of the college, the other pieces he managed to get. The museum will buy them as usual, no questions asked. Yes, they are nice. The Ark of the Covenant is a gold-covered wooden chest described in the Book of Exodus as containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. You know, Moses. Thou shalt not steal. Don't. <laughs> the Ark is a potential weapon, and since Hitler is after it, they ask Indy to find it. And they're prepared to pay handsomely for it. And the museum? The museum gets the ark when we're finished. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh. The Holy Grail, according to the Bible, is a cup used by Jesus at the Last Supper, also the cup that caught his blood at the crucifixion, and supposedly gives the gift of youth to those who drink it. Indy doesn't have any interest in it until after his father disappears while in search of it. After finding him, his father exclaims that, the quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. If it is captured by the Nazis, the armies of darkness will march all over the face of the earth. It's one of the only instances where he's actually kind of selfless. This is an obsession, Dad. I never understood it. Never. Hmm, your past actions would beg to differ. The Crystal Skull. Indy basically gets thrown into this adventure to save his old friend Ox, as well as Mutt's mother, through no particular desire of his own. So he's in it to save someone. Looking at Indy's actions, the overwhelming reason he goes after these artifacts is for his own selfish desire and to proliferate colonialism. Why does this matter? It has historical implications that exist to this day. Anderson Benedict in Imagine Communities identifies museums, alongside the census and maps, as being three institutions that profoundly shaped the way in which colonial state imagined its dominion the nature of the human beings it ruled, the geography of its domain, and the legitimacy of its ancestry. Museums are institutions that house historical information, both material and immaterial. If a museum is owned by a country or an organisation that stole these things through violence, you can see why this might be an issue. The institutions, as governors of knowledge, were able to curate what information was said and what was not said. For example, in the Dutch East Indies up until the 1930s, the idea was put forward that the builders of some monuments were not of the same race as the current natives, that they were really Indian immigrants. In Burma, under British rule, the notion rose that native people weren't capable of their ancestors' achievements. Anderson continues, Seen in this light, the reconstructed monuments, juxtaposed with surrounding rural poverty, said to the natives, Our very presence shows you have always been, or have long become, incapable of either greatness or self-rule. It was a compromise of sorts to have some information or museums and preservation, so that the colonised people wouldn't raise much of a fuss about their history being destroyed, because look, we have it here, it's here for you people to see and learn about. But don't say anything about the fact that we destroyed your cities, killed your people and stole cultural and material capital from you and shipped it back to our homeland, okay? In 2019, you'd think that Britain would have tried to make amends for these past atrocities. I mean, you can't bring back someone from the dead, despite what the Last Crusade says, but you can at least return some of these stolen artefacts, right? Repatriation is just that, and the fight for traditional ownership still continues. The Rosetta Stone from Egypt, the Kohinoor Diamond and Sultan Ganj Buddha from India, and the Parthenon Marbles from Greece are all still in British museums. A common argument against repatriation is that these museums cultivate the dissemination of knowledge and are also available for the public to view. I do agree with these general sentiments, but this puts forward a colonialist notion of Western countries being the hub of human culture. To display these artifacts anywhere else would be a disservice to the preservation of history, and that Western countries are the only true arbiters of how history should be studied, owned, and showcased. In Indiana's case, he is obsessed with finding these items, not necessarily the preservation, and is happy to get paid for doing so and sell them to an American museum upon delivery. For the most part, he doesn't care about who could possibly have traditional ownership of these artifacts because he knows best. Throughout the Temple of Doom, in his quest for the Shivalingam, the two villains, Chatalal and Mola Ram, call out this hypocrisy. I seem to remember that in Honduras, you were accused of being a grave robber rather than an archeologist. Well, the newspapers greatly exaggerated the incident. There were five stones in the beginning. Over the centuries, they were dispersed by wars, sold off by Thieves like you. Thieves like me, huh? Ha! 
Indy does find and return the Shiva Lingam to the village, but the film doesn't showcase any character development that would change Indy from his motivation of fortune and glory to genuine empathy. You could have kept it. Ah, uh, what for? They'd just put it in a museum, it'd be another rock collecting dust. But then it would have given you your fortune and glory. Anything could happen. <laughs> Canonically, this film is the first of Indy's adult adventures, so I guess that tracks from here on out. He's not going to question whether his motivations are problematic. Shatar Lal is also not shy of criticising the British occupation. Captain Blumbert and his troops are on a routine inspection tour. The British find it amusing to inspect us at their convenience. I do hope, sir, that it's not uh, inconvenient to you, well, sir. The British worry, sir, about their empire. It makes us all feel like well cared for children. But Mola Ram, he goes pretty hard. The British in India will be slaughtered. Then we will overrun the Muslims. Then the Hebrew God will fall. And then the Christian God will be cast down and forgotten. Soon, Kali Ba will rule the world. So close. By making the only anti-colonialist characters in the film, the Thuggy cult, synonymous with literal evil, kidnapping children for slave labour and sacrificing humans, we can see that the film has no interest in wrestling with the franchise's colonial premise and framework. So I guess it shouldn't have been any surprise to me at the end when Indian co were actually saved by... Captain Blumberg, Eleven Puna Rifles. Because colonialism? Pretty good. In going through the script, there's actually some unused dialogue from a previous scene that I'm pretty happy that they cut, which I'll reenact for you. You're hanging on better here than you did in America. This is a different situation, Dr. Jones. These people are like children. We have to lead them slowly into the 20th century. Leading on from Indy's motivations in the Temple of Doom specifically takes us to a short section on white saviors. White savior is an incredibly pervasive trope in media. I define it as a white character, not always the protagonist, who is usually placed as more moral, physically strong or intelligent person than their counterparts of colour, and saves these people from their oppression in some way or another. And while this might seem like a general net positive, it infers that people of colour are unable or even reluctant to better the circumstances, reinforcing the notion of white hegemony. This trope often downplays the power and scope that a structural system like racism has, and as a byproduct often deifies the white character. In the case of Temple of Doom, the shaman actually believes Indy was sent to them by the Hindu god Shiva. This is quite a small section as the trope only crops up in the Temple of Doom, but is more widely applicable to a lot of films past and present. There's a great video by Shrink Tank that talks about uh, a lot of modern examples of White Saviour, which I'll link below. There's also a deeply troubling trope of the savage native. In Raiders, the villain Belloc leads the Hovito's tribe to stop Indy from taking their fertility idol, which is pretty heroic actually considering Indy's a glorified thief. But then it's clear that Belloc has some type of undisclosed hierarchical power over them as he, as Lawrence Kazin writes in the script, turns dramatically and holds the idol high for all the Hovitos to see and says something in Hovitos. Also in the search for the Crystal Skull, Indy and Munt go to a cemetery. Grave robbers will be shot. Good thing we're not grave robbers. It's filled with native people protecting this place and so here come our heroes to literally rob it. Jones notes that these people are using poison, so they're obviously pretty serious about the place. They attack and Jones fights back. Not necessarily an issue, but he blows back a dart into one of the attackers, he scares off the other. He doesn't try and reason with them, despite the fact he probably knows what language they speak. Also, they just leave the poison guy there to potentially die? Like, I guess who cares, right? It's also interesting how native people are photographed in this film particularly. They show up like deadly animals or supernatural beings, not humans. They shoot off by the skull because they fear it and then they're ultimately slaughtered by the main villains. The message here is pretty clear. Natives and uncolonized people are not as deserving of dialogue, perspective, personality, agency, or humanization. They're just roadblocks, because Indy's the hero, and he'll only really get help from educated white people. And when there is an educated person of color, they're probably played by a white actor. Uh? Let's change the subject, shall we? People of colour are sorely misrepresented in casting in the media industry. There are a few systemic practices that still crop up even in our fairly progressive era. Some quick definitions. Whitewashing is the act of casting a white actor in a role meant for a person of colour. Sometimes, not always, the character is not changed to a white character but is instead framed as still being a person of colour. Brownface is used to distinguish ethnic impersonation of non-black people of colour using makeup, costuming and prosthetics. 
The term generally excludes East Asians, in which the term yellow face is used. The main point here is that insert coloured here plus face means impersonation of a different race. Personally, it's not as egregious as blackface as it doesn't have such a deep and abhorrent history, but it's still pretty fucked up. So let's go through the Indiana Jones franchise and see how many instances we can find of these practices. First, white people playing people of colour. You know that cool subversive scene every film buff knows where the Indy shoots a swordsman instead of using his whip? That character known as Arab Swordsman is played by the Welsh Terry Richards. The Anglo-English Pat Roach plays a giant Sherpa and the Chief Guard. Another Welshman, Ted Grossman, plays a Peruvian porter. They all have very obvious brown makeup on. Tut Lemkow, an Anglo-Norwegian Jew, plays an Egyptian Imam. And Alexei Sale, a half Anglo-English, half Lithuanian Jewish actor, plays a Turkish Sultan. Alfred Molina, who is half Italian and half Spanish, plays a Peruvian Satipo. The Welsh John Rhys Davies, most well known for playing Gimli, plays the Egyptian Salah Mohammed Faisal al Kahia. And I said, well, here's the thing. Salah is described as a five foot two, skinny Egyptian digger. Now, what do you propose, surgery? And while they thankfully did not make Davies undergo surgery, Spielberg was very happy to have stuntman Malcolm Weaver wear eyelid prosthetics and makeup to play. Oh, wait, who did he play? The role of Ratty Nepalese. Hmm. Racial contortion is a term I'm coining where a person of colour plays a non-white character whose ethnicity is very different from their own. Sonny Caldenez, who is Trinidadian, plays the mean Mongolian. Kiran Shah, a Kenyan-born Indian, plays the Egyptian Abu. It must be noted here that as a dwarf, Shah has obviously been limited by the industry in what roles he can and can't play. He was 24 when he played the role of child in Raiders. This nicely dovetails into white passing people of colour. White passing is a term used to describe people of colour that are perceived as white. Obviously this isn't a science. Who am I to say that you don't look like the ethnicity that you are? However, we don't live in a racially colourblind world and there are people, particularly actors, who will play up or play down their background to portray certain roles. In some instances, it's as simple as an accent, and other times it's brown face. Vic Tablian, an Armenian British actor, plays Barunka and Monkey Man. Kevok Malikian, also Armenian, plays a Turkish Kazim. There is some debate about whether Armenians are actually considered people of colour at all, but I'm not a historian and culture expert. Even the term people of colour has its problems. For myself, initially I had little to no knowledge about Armenians before this, but I found two really interesting Tumblr posts by Daniela Capistrano, as well as an article by Nazareth Markarian, which I'll link below. I would very much recommend reading these resources if you're interested in a bit of context about how whiteness as a racial category developed over the past couple hundred years. To summarise these, would take the nuances out of these pieces. Race aligned is another term I'm coining myself. It means casting a person of colour to play a person of colour of a similar ethnicity. I'll use the example of myself, a Sri Lankan Tamil being cast as a Punjabi Indian. Anthony Chin is Chinese-Brazilian, but it plays a Mongolian called Mohan. Akio Mitamura and Makuhiyama, who I believe are both ethnically Japanese, play two Chinese pilots. Kihu Kwan, who is Vietnamese, plays Short Round, who is supposed to be Chinese. British West Indian George Harris plays a Liberian Mr. Katanga. He's one of two black actors with dialogue throughout all four films, and they only both appear in Raiders. These examples are not particularly racist, but they're an example of how the industry homogenizes people of colour, because we all look the same, right? There's a counter-argument to this where actors should be able to play different ethnicities within reason. British-born Idris Elba, whose parents are Sierra Leonean and Ghanaian, played Nelson Mandela, who's South African. And most people didn't necessarily have a problem with that. But then there's an added complexity when you put the fact that Idris is British-born and raised, potentially taking the role from black actors and from South Africa, subtly reinforcing a notion of Western world superiority. Where is the line for actors when they're portraying a character outside of their own experiences? I don't have all the answers, but it's an intricate issue that requires a lot more discussion. But Barra, th these are films and these are actors, people who shed their personalities in order to embody another human soul. Are you saying that if an actor isn't from the same background as a person they're playing, then it's racist? Well, well then, what about when a person of colour plays a character who was written as white, huh? Isn't that racist biologic then? Mm, no more hammer for you, brownies. That argument is usually said in bad faith, but if that's an honest question you have, this is my perspective. More often than not, characters in Western film and TV is written by white as default. And usually there's no particular reason why this character has to be white. The Scorsese remake of The Departed is set in Boston and specifically about a white Irish crime gang, and that informs much of the references, humour, plot and execution of the film, which is why they cast white actors. 
but a film like Reservoir Dogs didn't necessarily have to be. In my perfect world, if there were equal roles available and accessible for people of all races, genders, abilities, etc, we wouldn't have to worry. There'd be a natural equilibrium that we could push one way or another to keep representation from skewing wildly. But it is not this day! After all that, there are some examples of accurate casting like Chatalal, Mola Ram and the Maharaja, but they're few and far between. In this section, I want to talk about how people of colour are used and portrayed in the narratives of all four films. For the most part, these films portray people of colour as one-note caricatures, either as scheming, violent, unintelligent, helpless, mystics or cultists. There are some small obvious exceptions like Mr. Katanga, the Maharaja and Kazim. Kazim in particular is actually quite interesting. He's initially portrayed as a villain, but once Indy realises they're both trying to keep the Holy Grail away from the bad guys, he lets him live. Kazim appears twice later on and his assault on the Nazis indirectly helps Indy, but he dies in the process. Although his screen time is brief, he's a glimmer of a character with a vital role in the film. Short Round is a bit more complex, but I feel he's a different type of caricature. He screams loudly in Mandarin, presumably for comedic effect. <laughs> while also serving as a surrogate for the audience that's constantly wowed or scared by the intense events of the film. <laughs> or by brown lemon dancing. I can't tell you why Short Round works with Indy, what his dreams and aspirations are, or what he cares about. With most of these supporting non-white characters, we rarely get to see fleshed out perspectives of these people. There's so much potential for interesting character work, theme and politics but it's rarely explored. Continuing on from that, there's a troubling aspect of filmmaking in general where characters of colour speaking in foreign languages are not subtitled. Why do I think that's a problem? Well, it's twofold. Firstly, it others people of colour. We and quite often many characters in the films don't understand what they're saying and so they're treated as alien and even antagonistic. The second reason is that we only know what they're saying when an English speaking character translates for us. So the focus is on them, again reinforcing the white perspective of the films. A clear example of this is where the shaman, speaking English for the previous two scenes, speaks in his native tongue. With him in the background, Indy walks stoically towards the camera, making us as the audience empathise not with the people who it's affected, but focus on the effect it has on our hero. Saying when the sacred stone was taken, the village wells dried up and the river turned to sand. Idure, ne? Ne. The crops were swallowed by the earth, the animals lay down and turned to dust. Then one night there was a fire in the fields. The men went out to fight the fire. When they came back, the women were crying in the darkness. Lama? Children. He says they stole their children. A few minutes later. Franchise fans will know that the actual actor, D.R. Nayakara, didn't speak a word of English, and that from behind the lens, Steven Spielberg dictated lines to him. They could have easily got a South Asian actor who spoke fluent English, but you know. Non-subtitled lines can work to a film's advantage, like when characters are bilingual and we're immersed in the world or when the audience is supposed to feel as isolated as a protagonist. But that's not really what's happening here. The dehumanisation of people of colour is rampant throughout the franchise through its bastardisation of culture. This is never more apparent than the monkey brain scene. Wait, you didn't know about the monkey brain scene? Well, it's the monkey brain scene to end all monkey brain scenes. As set up in the Temple of Doom, Indy, Short Round and Willy have come to Pankhart in search of fortune and glory. At a feast, as Indy chats to Chata Lal, Short Round and Willy dig into the food. First, something to whet the appetite. Ah, oh, sneak, surprise. What's the surprise? Then something crunchy. I had bugs for lunch. 
Give me your hat. Why? Because I'm going to puke in it. Oh. A hearty palate cleanse. And then dessert. Chilled monkey brain. I'm salivating just thinking about it. Look, maybe I'm being a bit too critical. Let's hear what the filmmakers have to say. The butt of the joke is clearly South Asian people, not the film itself. It's framed as look at all these primitive disgusting brown people who eat such disgusting things. If he really wanted to poke fun at ourselves, why not have Indy go out of his way to eat this food and try and impress everyone and not realise that his understanding of their culture is lacking? And before you ask, no. There's very little about Indian or Hindu culture that would suggest they eat these types of animals, and actually a significant amount of evidence to say that they would not even come close to eating snakes or monkeys. And no, again, eating beetles, snakes or monkeys is not any less or more inherently moral than eating other animals. And in case racist vegans want to type it furiously in the comments, I suggest you focus your efforts on the practices of food corporations from the Western world who engage in child and slave labour to overwork poor people from third world countries first. And you know, actually, to be honest, being raised as a Hindu for most of my life, I'm really, really sad that my mum never gave me any monkey brain desserts. That's just me. Mysticism also plays a role in punching down to people of colour. In Doom, the thuggy cult worshipped the Hindu god Kali. The main villain of the film, Mola Ram, is able to pull out people's hearts out of their body with no apparent topical or physical damage to his victims. And with them still alive somehow, he lowers them into a lava pit for sacrifices or whatever. I for one only have place in my heart for one lava pit scene in film, and that's uh, Turbo, a Power Rangers movie. Into the fire. Into the fire. Do it. Do it. Malico's power will exceed throw him in the fire. No. In addition to blood magic, the thuggy cult also practice voodoo? There's actually a fair amount of voodoo iconography in the film, as well as the use of a voodoo doll. What you've seen in media regarding the practice of the infliction of pain via an effigy is mostly false actually. Voodoo was a rich African religion with an incredibly interesting and complex history that became more widely practiced during the Atlantic slave trade. There's actually some really interesting articles and videos about voodoo that I'll link in the description. The crux of this is that the films like to take bits and pieces of non-white cultures and religions, distort and then blend them all together while continuing to perpetuate misconceptions that shape negative attitudes. And that really, really sucks. <laughs> tell us what to do, tell us how to fix you. What do you mean? What can we do, Wade? Tell us what to do. I think it'd be quite productive to see if I can figure out some small adjustments to each film to see how the themes and characters of colour could have been better served and less racist overall, without completely dismantling the core story beats. So let's go. At the end of the opening sequence, we're introduced to Belloc as the antagonist, who has tricked the Hovedo's tribe into helping him. So if we wanted to keep this introduction, we could also be introduced to the leader of the tribe who actually catches Indy, and actually explains that his fertility idol is not just some artifact to be plundered, but actually a sacred item to their tribe's culture. 
Belloc could be watching from afar or even beside the tribe, revealing that he was the one who told them about Indy just because he wanted to see him fail. Sulla, uh, crazy thought, should actually be played by an Egyptian, and we could actually have Sulla tell Indy that the Ark doesn't belong in the Western Museum. Either they rebury it when no one can find it, or they put it in the hands of Egyptian Museum. Because in the actual film, the Ark ends up being commandeered by the US Army. And the US Army has always and continues to use sources of unspeakable power in the most justified ways. Yes? Yeah? Right? First, let's cut out this orientalist dance number, or just have it be Chinese women doing their thing. Wuhan, Indy's friend, gets killed just like in the real film. It's a common trope for any characters of colour to be disposable, but we can actually give his death some meaning by using it to develop Indy's character. That's also a common trope, but I'm trying to make as little changes as possible and strengthen what's there. What could have been done here is to make Indy reject the shaman's call to adventure because he doesn't want Short Round to suffer the same fate as Wuhan. Blood is on his hands, and for what? A diamond to be put in a museum? Short Round should disagree with Indy and go and save his children himself, forcing Indy to run after him and then help. Easy. Indy learns that he can't just treat people of colour as disposable and should actually help them. Not perfect, but it's much better than what we have. Yet yeah, we're cutting the monkey brain scene, it's bullshit. To solve the villain problem in the film, there are two solutions that I kind of like. The first is since we have two villains, why not make one of them have a change of heart? Perhaps Shatalal turns against Molaram after seeing the true horrors of the cult. Second, we could have Molaram be a pro-colonial cultist leader who's also in league with Captain Blumbert, their goal being to control Pankot by any means necessary. To counteract that, we'd have the Maharaja outwardly state a non-violent anti-colonial sentiment at the dinner scene. At the end of the film, after the mind control, he can get his wish by kicking out the British forces. Don't make the thuggy cult worship Kali. It's pretty disrespectful to Hinduism to have blood sacrifice and slavery synonymous with service to one of the gods. And have anyone but Captain Blombert deus ex Barkin at the end. It could be fitting for the villagers earlier in the film, composed mainly of mothers, to fill that role. Perhaps Indy sends a message to them once he realises the cult is real, and then they make their way there, fearing for the imminent safety of their children, and then they can save the day, giving the agency to them. This film has the least issues, so the changes are pretty minimal. Kazim has the potential to be a great character. After he attacks the Nazis, instead of dying, have him be the only survivor of the Brotherhood and go along with Indy's crew to the Holy Grail. After the Grail is lost and within the temple, he could contemplate what he does now. Perhaps he continues to safeguard holy relics with Indy? Oh, and we're still keeping Salah as an actual Egyptian. Let's make John Hurt's Professor Oxley a South American academic. He's got an interest with the history and artifacts of his native continent. He's kidnapped by the Russians because of his knowledge of the Crystal Scar. Instead of natives, have Indian might go fight some Russians in the tombs to get what they need instead of just killing brown people. And when Indian crew reach Akator, have the native tribe welcome the return of the skull to its rightful home, but treat the heroes with caution. Once the Russians arrive, the tribe can hold them off for as long as they can, while a couple of the tribe's people take the team to where they need to go. The tribe doesn't need to get slaughtered. A few die for stake's sake, but the Russian leader manages to get around them and leads to the final confrontation. Lastly, aliens or no aliens. Apart from being just really dumb, the film insinuates that aliens were responsible for the city of Akator because there's no way people of colour could have created it, right? Was this film by the guy who thinks that aliens created the pyramids and weren't a result of incredible engineering and a shit ton of slave labour? It might have been that guy. <laughs> I don't know. To do all which may achieve and cherish a just and a lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. So what was the point of all this? Am I saying they're bad films? Am I saying that you shouldn't like them because of what I've talked about? Am I saying that you're a bad person for liking them? No. But I think it's important to deconstruct the media we consume to understand what they're saying on all levels. The Indiana Jones films and racism are intertwined with one another from concept to execution. Every single film in the Indiana Jones franchise was written, produced, and directed by white creatives. And the callousness they show towards non-white culture, history, and people really, really shows. These tropes are not relics of the past. If they were, I'd put them in a hat and go steal them from their rightful owners. But they're not. They're fixtures of cinema as we know it, and you only need to look back at the past couple of years to see that they're well and truly alive. What media says and doesn't say helps shape perceptions and discourse around it. It's true of news media, and I would argue even more so with film and TV. 
Narrative media is a Trojan horse. It's a way of filmmakers sneaking in what they want to say about life, love, conflict, and anything they care about into entertainment. It's synthesized into characters, events, dialogue, sound, and visuals that are all crafted to tap into your conscious and unconscious mind and affect you emotionally. So when narrative media consistently denigrates non-white culture, history, and people, and uplifts white supremacist themes and motivations, I can't help but just feel sad because it shows me that you don't care at all. I'm reminded of a quote by the famous movie critic Roger Ebert who once said, we are all born with a certain package. We are who we are, where we were born, who we were born as, how we were raised. And we're kind of stuck inside that person and the purpose of civilization and growth is to be able to reach out and empathize a little bit with other people. And for me, the movie's like a machine that generates empathy. It helps you understand a little bit more about different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. It helps us to identify with the people who are sharing this journey with us. And so I guess it's no surprise that in his reviews of the Indiana Jones films, he rated the first two 4 out of 4, and the other two 3.5 out of 4. Because film criticism is a fucking joke. Heroes, guys. They're all fallible. Earlier you were saying the film didn't have enough humanity. I don't go to an Indiana Jones film for humanity. At least he's dead, I guess. Oh. Nah, just kidding. Hey everyone, it's Barth. Uh, thanks for watching. Really, really appreciate it. Um, it's my first kind of foray into Left Tube uh, and hope to make a lot more videos uh, of this caliber. If you'd like to support me, uh, give us a like, subscribe, or even consider supporting me on Patreon. I'd like to give a shout out to Writing On Games for supporting me on the $3 tier. Um, I've got two patrons so far, which is great. Um, yeah, really, really keen to make more content. So, um, see you soon. Bye. Show it to your parents. Show it to your friends. When you've got Focal. the fun of ends. And did I mention it's free? I'll take some. There you go. Okay. Oh,